Colleagues, friends, and partners, a very warm welcome uh, to today's roundtable discussion on situating UN counterterrorism and preventing violent extremism efforts within the organization's broader reforms and the prevention agenda. Uh, my name is Ilko Kessels. I'm the executive director of the Global Center on Cooperative Security, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all uh, to today's discussion. We are delighted to have an excellent panel for you today to discuss an issue that is of central importance to the ongoing review of the UN Global Counterterrorism Strategy. In an increasingly saturated landscape of capacity development assistance, one strength that continues to differentiate the United Nations is its presence around the world. The organization's reform efforts and the Secretary General's prevention agenda have offered renewed opportunities to leverage this advantage by effectively uh, coordinating between headquarters, field offices, and missions in close collaboration with resident coordinators, UN country teams, host governments, and civil society. The reforms are organized around the central idea that the United Nations is a field-based organization. They seek to decentralize decision-making in an institution in which two-thirds of staff uh, members are working in the field. The resident coordinators sit at the center of this new framework. Newly independent, their offices are strategically placed to lead UN country teams' efforts in implementing the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and to support crisis prevention. Early gains have been observed in the resident coordinator-led uh, conflict prevention model, where many of the countries um, uh, that were studied uh, by UNU uh, emerged as less conflict-prone due to the preventative work carried out by resident coordinators and UN country teams, including supporting peace processes and dialogues, addressing underlying conflict drivers, and strengthening prevention capacities. At the same time, the reforms and the focus on conflict prevention should also allow for better integration of counterterrorism and PVE efforts across the three pillars of the United Nations, linking the implementation of the global counterterrorism strategy to priorities embedded in larger UN peace and security, development, and human rights work. As the organization's counterterrorism and PVE efforts continue to expand, it is critical that these are driven by longer term, context sensitive, local priorities that address the root causes. We are joined by an excellent panel today who often find themselves at the center of such coordination and implementation efforts. We have asked panelists to reflect on the opportunities and challenges in coordinating uh, and integrating conflict prevention and development efforts with a particular attention to preventing violent extremism. We also look forward to learning more about the different ways in which upstream counterterrorism and PVE approaches materialize and the different roles played by UN headquarters, resident coordinators, country teams, host governments, and civil society. As part of today's panel, I'm honored to welcome Ms. Valérie Julien, uh, UN resident coordinator in Indonesia, Ms. Hannah Singer, uh, UN, res UN resident coordinator in Sri Lanka, Mr. Kurt Mola uh, Abdul Ghaniev, UN peace and development advisor in uh, Kyrgyzstan, Ms. Nika Saida, team leader at Interim, Prevention of Violent Extremism, UNDP, uh, and as well as two representatives from civil society, Mr. Fadi Abi Alam, president of the Permanent Peace Movement in Lebanon, and Mr. Kineshbek Sanazarov, Central Asia Program Director for Search for Common Grounds. Before I welcome the remarks of our first panelist, a number of housekeeping items. Please note that today's event is being live streamed on YouTube and will therefore be on the record. The recording will be uploaded to our website and our YouTube channel. The panel discussions will be followed by interventions from the audience. Should you have questions for our panelists to respond to at the end, please relay those questions through the Q&A function that you will find at the bottom of your screen, rather than through the chat function. If you would like to make a brief two minute intervention as a participant, please use the raise hand function. We will do our utmost to give as many of you the possibility to share your reflections, starting with those that have pre-registered uh, upon um, registration for this event. If you have any technical difficulties during the event, please get in touch with my colleague, Ms. Adele Westerhuis, uh, and she will be able to assist you. Having said that, I would now like to welcome our first panelist, Ms. Valérie Julien, UN Resident Coordinator in Indonesia. Uh, Ms. Julien, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, very great, good greetings to all of you. Good evening from Jakarta. Good morning to you in New York. All the distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to be here uh, to speak to you today on a topic that is very close to my heart and certainly to yours as well, which is the topic of peace. Actually, in Indonesia, the very concept of peaceful conflict resolution, which is called Musayawara Mufakat, 
is, is really the epitome of the society. But sadly, many groups try to divide the people of Indonesia to destroy peace, using violent extremism as the method to impose their views and their nefarious agenda. Luckily, the majority of Indonesians have rejected this method, but nevertheless, we are facing the problem. So it is within this context that we measure how important it is to build a partnership between the UN and the member states, in that case, Indonesia, but it applies to all the member states, in order to further support the efforts of the member states to build social cohesion, inclusive societies and, and, and resilience to fight violent extremism. So I have maybe three main messages to pass on. The first one is coordination is essential. Actually, the Secretary General's plan of action to prevent violent extremism is very clear. What it says is that we will only be successful in preventing violent extremism if we apply a whole of government, whole of society approach, which means that no country can solve this issue alone. And with the advent of internet, which has allowed, of course, violent extremism to cross borders very easily, we need even more so an international cooperation. But an effective response requires that we bring together a vast array of government experts, of uh, actors, civil society uh, partners, and sometimes they are not accustomed to working together, but they're all necessary. For instance, in Indonesia, more than 40 government agencies were involved in the development of the National Action Plan for Preventing and Countering Violent Extremism. The plan was actually recently signed by the president. So to be successful in bringing all those experts together, we need a good coordination, a coordination that breaks silo, that brings all the actors together. And this was actually the intention behind the Peace Hub. So let me tell you about the Peace Hub. The Peace Hub in Indonesia is a one-stop shop interagency platform for all the UN agencies that are part partnering with the government of Indonesia on counterterrorism and prevention of violent extremism. It all started in May 2019 when UNODC spearheaded the establishment of the Peace Hub under the umbrella of the Resident Coordinator's Office uh, in Indonesia. At the beginning, there were only three agencies. Now we have nine agencies that are covering all the different work that we do in counterterrorism and PVE in Indonesia. The hub coordinates about $9 million of program each year, and it provides a hot desk, also co-working space for technical experts, but not so much during COVID restriction time, of course, but it's also an online forum for collaboration, information sharing, and knowledge management. Actually, the Peace Hub has generated three multi-agency projects, including the Guyu project that has already reached 50,000 beneficiaries in its second year of operation. Let me tell you about Guyu because I think Guyu is a very good example of how it works. Guyu in, in Bahasa Indonesia means harmonious or at peace. It was launched in 2019 and it is really the collective UN effort in supporting the government of Indonesia to tackle the threat of violent extremism in East Java, but also throughout Indonesia. It is funded by the UN Trust Fund on Human Security, and it is under the direct accountability and oversight of the UN Resident Coordinator. With the GUYU project, we work actually with youth, teachers, religious leaders to promote a positive narrative in their community and online space. We also partner with law enforcement and government agencies to, to enhance prevention efforts that break the cycles of hatred and protect society. We also tackle the threat of radicalism in villages. And how do we do that? Well, we empower several women's groups to take on the role of agent for peace. We have what we call the Peace Village Initiative. We provide regular training on conflict resolution and how to locally prevent, detect, and address early sign of violence. So through the Peace Hub, actually we did what I was mentioning at the beginning. We broke the, we broke the silos, we worked together. And I have to say that the beauty of it all is that we have achieved that through a very small investment. UNODC actually contributes one program officer working at one quarter full time to do this coordination. Now there is a second aspect that I want to raise is that by its very nature, terrorism really ignites fears 
within us. And it can lead to a short-sighted decision because in the wake of an attack or when a community is under the, the, the I would say the threat or fear, it can be tempting to demand harsh responses, to act first and talk about it later. We must always resist this. And I really wish to strongly emphasize the importance of pillar four of the UN Global Counterterrorism Strategy that clearly states that human rights for all and the rule of law are the fundamental basis for the fight against terrorism. If we do not respect human rights, we lose everything. And we know that an approach that is guided by security consideration alone might lead to some quick wins, but it will never provide an enduring solution. It will never lead to peace. As the resident coordinator of the UN in Indonesia, human rights for all is a fundamental commitment that I expect to be enshrined throughout all the work of all the agencies in Indonesia. And it is all the more important in a post-COVID world where we know that the social compact between citizens and government authorities is under great strain. Actually, trust has been lost. We know that. And not only in Indonesia, in all over the world, it must be restored. And it will only be restored under human rights approach. Now, a third essential component for a successful strategy to counter terrorism is prevention. We must act before it happens. Unfortunately, and similar to coordination, it is quite challenging to raise funds for prevention efforts. Have you noted that usually funds are readily available when there is a disaster, when there has been a terrorist attack or during a conflict? And it is far more challenging, particularly in the field, to mobilize resources, to raise awareness, to implement intervention that enhance re uh, resilience of communities, to reduce the likelihood of a conflict in the first place. And one of the reasons is because a successful prevention is not visible. You don't see the impact of it for the very reason that a foil terrorist attack, by definition, has never happened. So we must invest in prevention and let go of the imperative of visibility to the benefit of the imperative of saving life and keeping peace. So my goal and that of my office and the Peace Hub is exactly this to avoid disasters rather than waiting for them to happen. So in conclusion, we must invest in prevention. We must break down the silos and bring the full spectrum of agencies and expertise. We must uphold human rights and the rule of law in all what we do. And we can only achieve this through an effective coordination. The RCO in Indonesia and the Peace Hub have actually demonstrated that investment in coordination have a significant and tangible impact. The promising model actually of the Peace Hub has been adopted by the government of Indonesia, which has established its very own version of the Peace Hub and they call it actually the Knowledge Hub or the K Hub. So in Indonesia, we have tried to learn from each other. So I hope that these inputs will help in the, in the debate. Terima kasih banyak, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Julian, for, for your remarks and for some of those very concrete examples of what, what prevention and coordination looks like uh, at, the, at the local level. Um, it is great to see uh, the efforts of the Peace Hub recognizing not just some of the funding needs that exist uh, at, at the local level in prevention efforts, but also very practically bringing people together slightly less, less uh, slightly more difficult these days, but bringing them together in the same room, working together on these issues, uh, providing uh, an actual physical space uh, to do so. So thank you so much for uh, those, those insights and for, for the work that you do uh, in Indonesia. Um, we're going to turn next uh, to uh, Ms. Hannah Singer, uh, UN Resident Coordinator in Sri Lanka. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh... Good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to uh, all of you, to all the participants. Um, and thank you, Valerie, for an excellent introduction um, uh, to the subject matter. Uh, colleagues, uh, dear participants, as you know, I am the resident coordinator in Sri Lanka, a country that suffered decades of terrorism in a way that has shaped society and scarred it drastically and dramatically. A country that in 2019, 10 years after the end of the war, 
when it thought that terrorism was but a distant memory, was again shocked by another major attack that claimed the lives of so many and importantly returned fear to the center of the public opinion and policy making. This in turn has brought back distrust and distress, stigmatization of entire communities, scrutiny on associations, hate speech, and in some cases, an overzealous approaches to law enforcement and intelligence. Now, Sri Lanka counterterrorism legal framework is, I can't hide it really, is problematic. It's prevention of uh, terrorism act, or what we call the PTA of 79, offers a potential for abuse, of which there is evidence in the past. This year, new regulations have been passed supplementing the PTA that increases such concerns. The UN High Commissioner of Human Rights and the UN Human Rights Mechanisms have consistently pointed out the shortcomings of this legal framework and alerted to the potential to exacerbate rather than mitigate conflict. The UN human rights bodies have also expressed concern over a perceived shrinking space for civil society and activities, uh, increased militarization of state uh, structures and lack of our accountability for past human rights violation. It is in this context that the link between the counter-terrorism agenda and the prevention agenda is stronger. Understanding that preventing conflict and human rights violations is an intrinsic part of combating terrorism. Prevention means not only avoiding terrorist attacks, but also preventing stigmatizing communities, infringing on fundamental rights or exploring shortcuts to the rule of law. Terrorism and violent extremism thus requires robust law and order responses to investigate and combat terrorist organization and address key operational challenges in relation to their funding, to their training, and to their arming, etc. But in law and order, or but law and order is only one part of the picture. If we don't address the dynamic that lead individuals to join a terrorist organization, we may diffuse the threat today only to see it um, reignited tomorrow. The UN with its diversity of experience and specialized mandate is thus in a privileged position to understand the balancing challenges and uh, the priorities that define the counterterrorism and prevention agendas. Now, as Valerie had said before me, the strengthened role of resident coordinators gives us the possibility to better coordinate the multiplicity of different approaching, approaches ranging from pragmatic capacity building to law enforcement to outspoken advocacy for change when required. For instance, the UN in Sri Lanka jointly lobbies for a drastic overhaul of the Prevention of Terrorism Act and we are engaging the whole of government to advocate for change and raise our concerns over non-human rights compliant measures. At the same time, we understand that working together with security agencies gives us the possibility to better understand opportunities for positive reform and gaps in procedures or legislation. For instance, while the new de-radicalization regulations raise serious concerns and have already been challenged in court, UNODC ongoing work with the security apparatus will likely help us identify workable alternatives and mitigating measures. So by fostering these working relationships with the government, the UN can on one hand be critical of the measures, but on the other hand also uh, maintain access now, however, this should not be confused with the UN support to these regulations, and I underline that. In this context, the UN has to balance its support to national efforts to combat terrorism with the need to frame that support in the most effective ways 
to promote peace building, to promote reconciliation and social cohesion. The only way that prevention priorities can be effectively considered. In this sense, the UN intervention aim at reinforcing security approaches by firmly grounding them in the international normative framework, emphasizing international human rights standards and best practices, applying global expertise and international norms locally, and working together, delivering on a comprehensive package of response, combining bottom-up and top-down approaches, and incorporating strict due diligence and do no harm principles in our programming. Now, this is not an easy task. And we are aware that engaging in certain areas where government policy or practice do not fully align with international norms and standards could be misunderstood as an endorsement or legitimizing a legitimization of these policies. But at the same time, refusing to engage will not make those problems go away. It will simply reduce our influence in the outcome. Unfortunately, there is no really um, ready uh, answer uh, to address this dilemma across the board. And we need to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis using every tool in our toolbox. These tools include, for example, the UN Human Rights Due Diligence Policy, the HRDDP, that provides coherence to our support to non-UN uh, security forces and helps us to systematically analyze risks and possible mitigating measures and decide accordingly. These tools also enhance, include enhanced early warning and monitoring and analysis processes that reflects the understanding of different stakeholders. They include also conflict sensitive and victim centric uh, risk assessments and common country analysis and knowledge uh, products such as uh, our hate speech um, tracker. Different parts of the UN um, are working together with this, uh, with, uh, with this, um, on this, um, working together on programming to prevent and counter violent extremism, taking into account the full spectrum of counter terrorism and uh, um, PVE, from prevention and civil society to investigation, prosecution, uh, adjudication of the terrorism cases, all while advocating for increasing increased human rights compliance. The partners work with a plethora of government entities and civil society organization, ensuring a balanced, uh, a balanced approach. For instance, UNODC is also providing uh, counterterrorism relating uh, training for prosecutors and will soon expand and conduct training also for uh, defense lawyers as recently requested by the Bar Association in Sri Lanka. In addition, with the well-recognized challenges presented by the conditions conducive to terrorism, UNODC works extensively to reform the prison uh, system in line with the, the Mandela rules, reducing overcrowding, addressing radicalization, and steering away from excessive use of force. And I work very closely uh, with them on that. On the PVE front, my office and the UNDP work closely with the UNDP Crisis Bureau in uh, implementing the crisis risk dashboards that monitors and reports issues affecting violent extremism and the spread of hate speech in the country. Additionally, UNDP is also working to identify the key policy and partnership uh, gap uh, and is working with the civil society to implement the PVE programs. Um, UN responses build in uh, and on multiple partnership, not only within the government, the security apparatus and the different UN agencies and mandate, but also with relevant stakeholders outside the UN, with youth, women, religious communities and civil society playing a central uh, role. We need all these partnership to challenge the narrative of fear and mistrust that are the core for any terrorist phenomena and protect those most vulnerable to terrorism and violent extremism ideology. 
Thank you very much uh, for uh, uh, listening and thank you very much for holding this extremely important uh, seminar of uh, panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Singer, for, for your very insightful remarks. It is it's great to hear uh, the work that you and colleagues are undertaking in, in Sri Lanka. And I particularly appreciate it. Um, uh, this, this very tricky, very difficult balance that needs to, needs to be stricken between on the one hand, being vocal, being critical, pushing back on certain counterterrorism measures uh, that affect uh, human rights, uh, but also at the same time, maintaining access and supporting change uh, through capacity building, through other uh, forms of partnership. That, that should not be mistaken for an endorsement of those policies, but should be seen as a push um, to move into the right direction. And, and so very much uh, value uh, your, your insights there on, on how tricky that can be uh, on the on, on the day to day. Um, we're turning now uh, to uh, Mr. Kurt Mola Abdul Ghaniyev, uh, the UN Peace and Development Advisor uh, in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, Kurt Mola, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning good and good evening colleagues, uh, wherever you are in the world. Uh, greetings from Kyrgyzstan. I will start briefly what is uh, why I'm here and why Kyrgyzstan is interesting. Kyrgyzstan UNCT implements a portfolio of projects funded by the Peace Building Fund. And in the last uh, three years, our focus and all the projects were focused on preventing violent extremism. We are thinking about, we are saying about the portfolio of uh, several projects on $18 million around. I will start uh, right to the point and our discussion about the silo approach and UN reforms. I would actually argue that PV programs that are implemented by the UN country team uh, in countries I worked on, Kyrgyzstan specifically as well, they do not work in silos because it may so because we don't work with some specific groups. We don't work with the FTFs or returnees or people convicted of extremism. We don't have access to these groups of people. Our work is uh, located in a wider prevention modality and uh, we are implementing programs for different groups it's with local community, youth, uh, women, prisoners, religious leaders, and we build their resilience to extremist narratives. Uh, but at the same time, our this non silo approach and very much embedded in the programming approach creates another problem. Uh, as programs are quite heavily embedded into the main, mainstream operations, we are concerned that the theories of change that we apply in our operation may not necessarily address the problem. And we have always our doubts, right? First of all, it's a part of the overall prevention dilemma, which was actually mentioned by Valérie in her um, speech as well. We, how do we know that something did not happen because we worked or we, or we uh, took action, right? Violent extremism is such a convoluted issue and phenomenon. There are so multiple push and pull factors issues of identity, discrimination, perception of justice, psychological inclination, family context, and all this has an impact on decision of joining the extremist organizations. That's why we at the moment don't have an undeniable proof that our, I don't know, critical thinking courses or entrepreneurship support for women in rural areas or participation and promoting participation and voice of youth and decision-making local areas actually reduces the risk of extremism. And we need constantly to look out whether our PV work actually is not lost uh, in not diluted in the activities of the UN. Of course, there are different solutions we apply to this. For example, in, in one of the approaches, the geographical targeting and selection of the beneficiary groups. Uh, we work in the districts uh, and areas from which people were mainly recruited to ISIS, for example or which are known for traditional higher religious practices or with high share of minorities or other vulnerabilities. But we do not distinguish, distinguish for specific families, uh, like specific groups, uh, because in a heavily securitized environment, focusing on some specific groups and some people can actually bring harm. And we try to avoid this, cost at any, uh, this, this issue at any cost. This is again very much goes to what Valerie said about the importance of the human rights, because we refrain of supporting of several certain securitized, like for example, bringing investigation capacity of certain kind in 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 law enforcement. Yeah, and there are of course programmatic adjustments. For example, we are engaging really religious leaders working with the madrasas. We are also because of this programmatic concern, we are uh, adopted the learning and adaptation strategy 
which actually adjusts our programming and reviews the th theories of change during the program. It's already not uh, before, the, but also the, uh, during the program implementation. And in Kyrgyzstan, um, again, this is a truly bottom-up and programming principles are often triggered, or I would say even forced or imposed because we are the PBF recipient. We are recipient of the Peace Building Fund, um, which is the key, key partner in, in, uh, uh, for sustaining peace agenda in the country. So overall framework of programming is based on in-depth analysis, consultations with the government and the various stakeholders and, and at the, in the communities. Uh, we also have a joint steering committee, which also includes civil society organizations, which supervise and guide the implementation at a later stage. We also, in terms of the jointness, uh, PBF is also good because it somehow imposes the interagency cooperation. All our projects are uh, engaged, uh, implemented by two or three agencies. And thanks to the available and relatively larger funding and predictable funding, I would, I would say we are able to work in development and human rights pillars and also humanitarian, also in our context, it's very limited. It's limited to some food for training and food for asset programming um, at the, in some areas, but not critical. Again, joint programs prove to be harnessing the competitive advantage of the agencies, of individual agencies. Also, again, problem here is the, they increase the transaction cost because the coordination, which is again, as extremely important set by previous uh, RCs, is, is always requires more resources to be allocated. Uh, and uh, it's, you know, everything is joint. We need to develop the joint work plan, joint communication plan, joint m &E plan, et cetera. We still have issues with this jointness. Uh, in some cases, they are addressed better. In, in some cases, not, but we try our best. It also comes from the different operational modalities. Agencies operate, uh, have different reporting lines. Some are resident, have a greater presence in the field, other less operational procedurals, uh, procedures, etc. So the key problem is to that. But key problem for me as a PDA and also as for the resident coordinators is to ensure that the agencies do not do their work as business as usual and adopt peace building lenses to programming. Because, you know, UNICEF is doing upshift or UNDP doing the employment programs. How is, is this PVE, right? And we need also to make sure that they adopt a specific lenses and specific targeting and specific group uh, and geographical targeting to, to bring the, the peace building um, dividends. And again, the RC's role here was very critical to ensure that. Again, a very practical note on the UN reform. Uh, from me, from my position as PDA, I see greater cooperation. I see really improvement in my daily work. I'm working both with the PBSO and DPPA at the same time. And recently, DCO is also increasingly engaged. We have the also regional peace and development advisor, who is also my liaison to the DCO and regional, regional hub, regional office. And uh, for example, DPA, DPPA reviewed and supports us in PBF eligibility process together with PBF, so SFA, of course. And it's, uh, we are, as for, from other tools, of course, RMR is very important uh, and uh, Kyrgyzstan has been regularly on uh, re regional monthly review. I mean, those who maybe not know the union jargon here, but it's also a very valuable prevention tool. Uh, we also, we are currently at the Kyrgyzstan re-eligibility process and when we also see this re-eligibility and readiness of the UN to uh, discuss this as a reflection of an increasing understanding of the prevention needs because we, again, Kyrgyzstan is not the country you wouldn't find on the CNN headlines, but at the same time is very fraught with multiple risks, a recent revolution in October or the overthrowing of the president, change of constitution, etc., etc. So there is also a history of violence um, multiple times in the country. Uh, including actually today's cross-border incidents. But um, that's a very important uh, to prevent and try to prevent in, this, uh, this, this, um, in, in the country. And uh, not only peace building pillar reform actually contributes to a greater cohesion, but I would say that also a development pillar system reform. So the UN resident coordinator's office are better placed today to lead the team and uh, on the peace building. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kurdmala, for, for sharing your insights there and particularly how some of those reforms have, have trickled down uh, to um, uh, the level of program implementation where you see uh, the adoption of those peace building lenses, those partnerships existing. 
Um, but at the same time, I think you raised some some really practical challenges uh, in regards to prevention work in general and PV work in particular. That that many of the participants um, in in this meeting uh, will will know will know all too well. Uh, problems around the theory of change, uh, target group definition, uh, questions in terms of doing doing more harm than than good. Uh, I think are all all too too realistic. So thank you so much for uh, for raising those. Um, thank you also to those participants who've already raised uh, some questions in the Q&A. Uh, I will continue to invite others uh, to continue to do so, uh, and we'll ask the panelists to come back uh, to some of these questions uh, towards the end of the meeting. Um, and if you would like to make a brief two-minute intervention or raise a question as a participant on video, uh, please do use the raise hand function. Uh, we will do our best to get to you, uh, time permitting. Um, so now next, I'm going to turn to Ms. Nika Saida, uh, PVE team leader uh, at UNDP. Nika, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Elko, and thank you, colleagues in Global Center on Cooperative Security. Um, it's very hard to come after Valerie, Hannah, and Kurt Muller bringing the whole um, what's happening on the ground and from different perspectives. So thank you so much for sharing um, and giving me this opportunity to build on that. Um, just want to speak about what UNDP is doing and then go much bigger and broader in terms of the theoretical complexity and operational complexity. Because when we are speaking about the UN reform, we are talking about three main principles, the whole of government, the whole of society, and the whole of UN. And these are very fundamental elements that it's bigger than even all of us trying to achieve. And um, if you would have achieved it, we wouldn't be here even today. Anyway. Um, so since 2014, UNDP has been working to develop a deeper and more nuanced understanding of violent extremes. It has been a long way. We aim to address two interlinked challenges. The rise of violent extremism using a development and peace building approach, firmly grounded within human rights principle, and the secondly, the need to govern increasingly diverse and multicultural societies. This requires attention to institution, political and religious ideologies, and making sure this is within the promotion of human rights based approach. But actually, what does that mean? Let's look at the guiding principle for at least uh, UNDP and many of us sitting around here. It's the SG plan of action on prevention of violent extremism. It has, you know, eight main pillars. And through that, you have the conflict prevention and dialogue, you have governance, you have youth engagement, women, economic recovery. This is quite complex. And that was the reason I'm actually love leading this portfolio because it creates opportunity to look comprehensively at the issue. It's not only conflict analysis, but also a political understanding, geopolitical issues understanding. The fact that, you know, as Kurt Mullah mentioned, identity, um, and migration, all of them come into existence of how to deal with the challenges. And while an extremism, and I know there is not actual definition for that yet, um, you know, has been, um, we are still struggling to come with the one concrete definition, but we all know it in our own way of understanding what we are speaking when we talk about rise of violent extremism. So, but in the theory, so the prevention agenda, as Wallery mentioned, it's the most fundamental and we need to put all of our energy and effort on the prevention. And that's something we don't do always great. We become very responsive. After an attack, everyone gets excited. Everyone wants to do something because it's in the news. We are very much motivated sometimes by the news, by the complexity, and, and not because of, of our lack of understanding, because of, for example, as um, Mallory again mentioned, the funding issues, challenges, we are not able to be beyond, bigger than who we are. Um, but it comes on the theoretical complexity that YPVE, which is needed, which is very complex and integrated, and we always have been encouraged by everyone to have an integrated and comprehensive approach, it's complex in implementation. One of the complexity, it's because it's associated and is one of the pillar of counterterrorism. We know the counterterrorism, it's not only the definition of the UN Security Council of which organization or group is a terrorist. We know that definition has been used and misused in many ways. And that creates challenge. We even when we are speaking with the people on the ground, they say, this person is terrorist, that person is terrorist. And then you ask yourself, where this, where, where this is coming from? 
the dehumanization of each other, it's what we are dealing with. And that definition of terrorism, it's not the one we are speaking of, it has become mainstream in our society, dividing us. The state can issue, as um, Hannah mentioned, the, um, the act and legislation that even has been promoted by many governments creating complexity in preventing violent extremism. So one of our main job as the UN is to support member state, to work with civil society and our colleagues from civil society will allude to that. The importance of creating a greater conversation because at the end, we are dealing with the security issue, but what does that mean in peace? So in the theoretical level, when you're talking about PVE, when we're bringing a civil society to talk within the framework of counterterrorism, they are even afraid. They are even afraid of speaking. They are even afraid of attending in some places, in some places not. So are we protecting them? Are they being, um, if, you know, um, if um, uh, civil society is engaging, what are the legal framework and implication for a civil society to talk and communicate with a group that possibly has been designated as a terrorist group? We are facing those challenges and we don't have much solution sometimes. And that's why the local solution is the solution. So these are like some of the theoretical challenge we are facing, but um, and um, Alco, please stop me anytime I'm going beyond the time. Um, but then also we have an uh, operational issue. Um, Alco, you mentioned about, it's about coordination, about UN reform, about working together. As UNDP, we are currently covering 34 countries who do a um, direct program in PVE. You know, Kurt Mala has been working with us in Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan. We do have program in Indonesia, Sri Lanka, and across other regions, as actually across the five regions. So on the operational issue, we are a very UNDP stand for programming. So the programs, it's the bread and butter of what we do. And our HQ presence is much smaller. So then you want to work and collaborate with the other UN agencies that they don't have the same framework. How does it look like from the HQ to country office, working with the region or working with our partner? For example, we work um, with UNODC, with UNESCO on repatriation and supporting to, um, we work very closely with UNICEF or we work one, you know, it's the entire UN system. You cannot deliver PVE out of your system. And actually, um, Kurt Malo, I do, I, I do acknowledge a PVE program has been the one actually uh, engage more UN system in delivering than any other program. Because it's by default, you cannot deliver on the eight pillars if you don't work with others. We don't have, even as the UNDP, we don't have all of that. Um, we don't have the, all the expertise, we don't have the connection. And so there are operational issues. For example, we have developed an action plan with UNOCT to come with some of the coordination mechanism and possibility of better understanding, understanding that they have a strong presence on HQ. We do have a strong um, country office, but what does that mean to work together and complement each other? We work very closely. We have a project we, uh, in Asia. Actually, we work with UNODC colleagues and um, also with UNOCT, and then we run it through our Bangkok region covering um, um, eight countries. So there are coordination has been uh, put in place. Civil society play an important role. And I just want to add, civil society are not the answer of making um, um, PVE program inclusive. It's very narrow-minded if we think civil society are the only spokesperson of people. We have to come with mechanism. And um, um, Kurt Mala, you remember in, uh, for example, in Uzbekistan, we come up with the online engagement of the youth. That was one way that we come up or looking at the behavior inside, even, even we assuming that we deliver project, but is it a sticking? Is it making work? Uh, does it work? So there are many nuances to look at it. Or for example, the mental health and psychosocial support that we are providing, not stigmatizing people, but understanding some of the challenges are not only extremes, they are much larger framework that hasn't been addressed. Uh, so anyway, um, Alko, I know we are going to have a question and answer, so I don't want to add to the complexity and I want to create more space for colleagues to contribute. Um, so I pass it over back to you because, um, and by finishing, um, let's not to also forget, and I know Valerie would like that because she also cares a lot about the environment, not to only say civil society includes women, youth or religious leaders. Our environmentalists, where do they stand? One pillar of the PVE is to deliver 
um, you know, emergency employment, uh, strengthen the access to livelihood, but is it also climate sensitive? So that's another area we look into that. There's a lot of opportunity and then a lot of area to collaborate. So over to you, Elko. Thank you so much, Nika. I appreciate you uh, just highlighting the, the complexity of what PV actually is or what it could be. And the fact that, that by its very nature, it requires us to coordinate a uh, whole of government whole of society, a whole of UN, is, as you rightfully mentioned, that both provides great opportunities, but also has very clear drawbacks, as, as uh, many others have, have referenced in terms of the coordination challenges, in terms of the funding challenges and the often responsive nature um, when it comes to the issue of, of terrorism. Uh, so appreciate you bringing, bringing those insights to, uh, to the virtual table. Um, we're going to turn next to uh, Mr. Kineshbek uh, Sanaizarov, uh, Central Asia Program Director for Search for Common Ground. Uh, Kinesh, thank you so much for joining us. I know you will need to leave us uh, around uh, at 10, uh, so very grateful uh, for, uh, for your remarks and for your presence uh, here today. Kinesh, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you. Um, Um, dear esteemed uh, panel members and participants of this round table, while respecting the protocol, since I have only five minutes for my intervention, please allow me to highlight five points around the issue under discussion. First, indeed, the UN system with its field offices around the globe, missions and headquarters, it's uniquely positioned to coordinate counterterrorism and PVE efforts. As a member of civil society, I, together with my colleagues around the world, value this. But as we know, PVE efforts need to build on the trust and relationship that civil society has established uh, with local communities over many, many years. And this, this trust is fundamental and precursor for any uh, further work. The secondly, the UN system has created a dialogue platform to make voices heard from grassroots level to marginalized groups. In light of a shrinking or at times even closing civic space around the globe, expression of concerns from civil society organizations, women and youth led groups, and especially human rights defenders, which usually, as you know, collide with the state institutions over human rights issues that the UN system has seized is very much appreciated. An impartial actor to engage the state uh, with, with the state institutions is urgently needed and in, uh, to ensure people's voices have a channel to be heard. However, I would add a, a word of caution here. PVE is, a, as you uh, highlighted, whole of society problem. But the UN is uh, first and foremost an association of member states. So naturally, there is a government-centric uh, inst and which can be um, a dangerous pa pathway in the context of civic space and where the key actors don't know or don't trust or don't like their governments. So this needs to be uh, 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 very mindful about this. So the thirdly, the system like UN should be constantly seeking new creative ways of engaging with civil society organizations, interest groups, and state institutions at, in a fast paced change of circumstances, especially in the area of counterterrorism and PVE. However, at times, we uh, see that the system is uh, sometimes bogged down into an internal bureaucracy, which limits the effectiveness of uh, on-time support to this society. And if, uh, my fourth point is about the UN system's role as an impartial actor and mediator. It could be well exploited if some of the severe push factors for individuals joining violent extremism organizations could be directly communicated with the host government institutions um, and the problem addressed through the whole of society approach. And then my last point is linked with my previous thought. Too much securitized approach in uh, counterterrorism and PVE 
is playing on the hands of violent extremist organizations, uh, unfortunately. While this, this approach, uh, uh, unfortunately, tarnishes the reputation of state institutions. Only the UN system can get this message across to the host government, uh, host governments and, and, and the society. Again, I'm very much pl uh, privileged to be invited in this unique panel as a member of the civil society organization. And my organization, Search for Common Ground, along with others around the globe, will continue dealing with the societal conflicts and tensions from adversarial approaches to collaborative solutions. Thank you again for giving me this opportunity. Thank you so much, Kinesh, for, for your reflections. It's really great to hear uh, some of the cases where you see a really important role uh, for the UN, uh, creating these platforms uh, to make voices heard at all levels, uh, raising those voices in the direction of uh, governments. Um, but at the same time, I think being uh, aware of some of the limitations of a member uh, state driven uh, organization uh, and the limitations of uh, being able to, to, to speak out in the ways, ways possible there. Uh, and indeed, some of the um, uh, negative effects of certain counterterrorism approaches and the uh, use and, and, and uh, misuse and abuse uh, of counterterrorism legislation and the labeling uh, of, of terrorism is, is something that is, has hit civil society and the state communities uh, across the world. And there in particular uh, should be a, a strong role and a strong voice of the UN uh, speaking, out, uh, speaking out against it. Um, last but certainly not least, uh, we're going to turn to uh, Mr. Fadi Abi Alam, uh, the president of the Permanent Peace Movement uh, in Lebanon. Uh, Fadi, the floor is yours. Thank you, Elko, for giving me such an opportunity to, to address uh, such an amazing audience. Uh, actually, we are thinking in the same way, it seems, you know, about hearing for, uh, for my colleague right now. Um, many countries in the world succeeded in developing short and long-term strategic comprehensive plans for violent extremism using a participatory approach. However, particularly many nations didn't establish a focal point or a unit to follow up, build networks, and monitor the efforts uh, done locally, nationally, and regionally. The absence of such an entity particularly happens in places that have higher terrorist rates than others. Setting strategies according to the participatory inclusive approach presents an opportunity for the different UN agencies in addition to the resident coordinators to take on the role of monitoring and evaluation as well as guiding the programs and projects that UN agencies work on in this direction. Also other international organizations can support the implementation and fund those efforts to ensure its sustainability. There are different sites to preventing violent extremism. One of the most important is related to human security. When the indicators of violent extremism appear, it requires setting an early warning and response mechanism in each country, especially in vulnerable ones. Such a network should be connected to not only government agencies, but also be accessible to local actors for a better intervention and interact with UN agencies. The effectiveness in preventing violent extremism requires improvement in the UN approach towards civil society. It's not enough even. It has to be transformed into a strong grounded strategic relationship that goes beyond short-term contracts for project implementation and let's say requests for proposals. This relationship can be done with specific civil society members who answer the set criteria for a long lasting relationship. This would allow the UN to becoming an active partner that is able to manage problems directly through local intervention with local actors on a small scale instead of it developing into something bigger on a large scale. Such a dynamic will benefit the local community and the government and will lead to successfully preventing violent extremism. This way, we would be empowering locals by playing the role 
of conciliation instead of mediation. This view goes hand in hand with the responsibility to protect of 205, especially the pillar related to prevention. This process does not require a modification in the UN's ways of working, but it requires raising awareness and capacity building to better understand the suggested approach for, UN, for the UN staff so it becomes more impactful and more responsive to the community's need and address violent extremism efficiently. We are confident that, e that civil society has the right tools to fight and prevent violent extremism. Taking it from up to bottom is not as impactful as tackling it from the roots bottom up. It will be handled by civil society that holds the culture of peace and tolerance. It is not a, co a coincidence to see a lot of violent extremism in countries where the regimes oppress civil society and vice versa. In conclusion, supporting civil society through a participatory approach and networking with them, as well as providing them with the right platforms regionally and internationally, in addition to necessary resources to work efficiently, strongly contributes to the fight against violent extremism. Moreover, it helps build a democratic government based on human rights. In this context, it is possible to secure an international cover for this process. In fact, as was published or issued by United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325 and 2250s concerning the role of women and youth in peace building, it is possible. It is possible to publish or to issue a similar resolutions that make it easier and constitutes an international recognition of the role of civil society in PVE. The programs and the projects that that the partnership between the UN and civil society would also strengthen such an initiative. It will transform the UN's image from closed offices to become closer to the people and more relatable through the civil society organization that shares the same values and objectives, especially peace and security. And thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Fadi, for, for your uh, remarks and perspectives there. And uh, I appreciate in particular uh, you pointing to this tricky balance of, of the UN uh, on the one hand engaging at, at a broader political level as, as a, a, a member state driven organization, but at the same time needing to work uh, at the local level with civil society organizations to really support and implement some of this programming, particularly in cases where uh, funding resources and the space for the implementation of some of those those programming might be quite difficult uh, to be done uh, by um, uh, through uh, uh, national uh, or local sources. Um, so it is a tricky balance uh, and one that we've heard uh, a number of uh, number of individuals uh, speak to as part of this uh, this panel. Um, we're now going to um, move towards um, uh, various interventions uh, by uh, the many participants that are, are joining us today. Uh, we'll bring up um, uh, those individuals for. A uh, maximum of two to three minutes. Um, please keep it short. Please raise any questions because at the end we will return back to our panelists uh, for any final uh, final reflections. Uh, so first and foremost, I'm going to start uh, with uh, our colleague uh, Masoud Karimpour, uh, the Chief of Terrorism Prevention Branch of UNODC. Uh, so Masoud, the floor is yours. Thank you, Yuko. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to uh, contribute. Uh, first of all, we're very proud of our partnership with the Global Center and, and of course, with the resident coordinators who have already spoken at the country level. Um, and of course, having received uh, their uh, comments, uh, there's very little for me to add, and I will not repeat what they've said. I will fully endorse everything that they've said, but I will highlight that a couple of points. Uh, one is that at the policy level, um, the whole of government and whole of society approach is absolutely critical, especially in preventing violent extremism, where security institutions are uh, notoriously uh, limited in their ability to reach stakeholders and to influence and uh, to uh, change behavior. 
Uh, for that, you need civil society fully on board. And for that, you need to break down the silos that have been referred to with between government and civil society. And there, of course, uh, as the RC in Indonesia uh, said, uh, well, coordination is critical and a little coordination actually goes a long way. And the Peace Hub is one example of it. Uh, you know, DC was proud uh, to be in the lead in uh, developing the, the Peace Hub and contributing staff time to it. And uh, the results uh, of the Peace Hub and the impact that it's had, the beneficiaries that it's reached, the funds that it's managed uh, speaks for itself. And so I would encourage anyone listening who wants their um, volunteer contributions uh, to go a long way, there's a model of uh, coordination that produces results. And I would encourage further investment in models like that. I'd like to also endorse uh, the RC's call for a more focus on prevention uh, in uh, every area of uh, crime and drugs and terrorism that I've been involved with uh, uh, in my various capacities in UDC. Uh, I have to say that prevention in uh, violent extremism uh, is highly effective and dollar for dollar uh, produces more peace uh, and resolves more conflict uh, than waiting till something blows up. Um, let me uh, quickly turn to a couple of other points. Uh, I know that uh, Hannah uh, spent uh, uh, quite uh, some uh, minutes on, on the balance um, uh, for uh, promoting human rights, but also staying engaged in settings where human rights are being violated. And I fully endorse uh, what uh, she said, and I won't repeat it, but I, I will also say that uh, the UN does not have the luxury of some other entities to just condemn, name and shame, and walk away and say mission accomplished. Our mission is not accomplished. Our mission is defeated uh, by that sort of uh, uh, approach. Uh, our uh, obligation under the UN Charter is to promote human rights and to fully engage, especially in countries where human rights are being violated. And by staying engaged, we change practices. And that has been proven time and again. And I fully support uh, Hannah's uh, efforts and leadership uh, on this front. A couple of cross-cutting issues. One is gender. There is just not enough women involved at the policy level, at decision-making level, or even at the operational level in violence, uh, preventing violent extremism, terrorism. And um, in every situation that I've seen, uh, and we have promoted uh, the inclusive approach both at the policy and at the operation level of uh, uh, the interests uh, and the perspectives of women and girls. And where countries uh, have adopted those, we have seen uh, a remarkable change uh, in both prevention and also uh, holding uh, terrorists to account. Um, we have published uh, the first ever uh, practical guidebook for member states to uh, how to in, uh, include more women at these levels uh, with remarkable results. And the other, and finally, is youth outreach. We just simply don't see enough youth outreach. And uh, there is, uh, I would say, the sweet spot, if you will, of where um, uh, preventing violent extremism and preventing people from becoming radicalized um, is uh, most effective uh, by encouraging more engagement with the youth. Uh, and of course, that brings me back to my very first point about uh, breaking down silos with civil society. I'll stop here because I don't want to abuse my time. I appreciate you calling on me because uh, I do have to go to another meeting, but grateful for the opportunity to uh, contribute. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Masoud. Uh, happy that you were able to, to stand for, for those remarks and, and uh, would definitely agree um, to a, a, num a number of the aspects that you mentioned that require more focus on gender, on youth. Um, uh, you know, again, these are central to broader uh, development and, and human rights and peace building activities of the UN, and, and they should be central in the organization's counterterrorism and, and PV work uh, as well as it supports member states uh, to um, uh, implement uh, the GCTS um, uh, as well as uh, the various uh, international legal, legal instruments. Uh, we're going to turn next to uh, Natalie uh, Schneider-Rittener, a legal advisor of the Permanent Mission uh, of Switzerland to the United Nations. Natalie, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody, and thank you, Ilko, for giving me the floor today. Um, Switzerland is very appreciative of this initiative and uh, would like to thank the GCSS for offering us all an opportunity to dive into this very important question. And also to thank you, I would like to thank you to all the interveners for sharing with us the very valuable insights. Uh, Switzerland considers that 
armed violence in our society does not occur out of the view. Uh, it finds its ground in the failures of addressing the people's material and immaterial needs. It feeds on exclusion, for example. It is therefore not sufficient to cope with the consequence of violence, but we must strive at eradicating the very causes of violence. The Secretary General, by proposing its uh, member states, um, its speedy plan of action in December 2015, um, and inviting member states, among others, to follow alternative paths, uh, I think this is very important, and, and Switzerland is working in this direction. Um, I would like to highlight two points here. Um, the PVE initiative um, that we have launched in 2016 and the necessity to link security responses to long-term prevention efforts in the area of peace and security, development and human rights efforts. On the first point, Switzerland launched an initiative called uh, Regional Conversation for the Prevention of Violent Extremism in the Sahel Sahara with UNOWAS and IPI. Over 30 meetings were organized so far in different parts of this region. More than 2,000 participants coming from backgrounds have been uh, involved with the objective to provide a dialogue platform to discuss on the approach to prevent violence, to build and reinforce bridges between a wide diversity of actors, and to encourage positive initiatives from the region offering concrete alternatives to violent extremism. The motto of this initiative is to invest in peace to prevent violent extremism. We would like to underline here that um, for this initiative to be successful, it is very important that it stays field driven. And also very important to say that this is related, should be related to many areas such as human rights, peace, security, and development. My second point uh, is the necessity to link the, in the implementation of the global counterterrorism strategy that is currently negotiated to the broader frame of UN peace and security development and human rights efforts. Not only from a thematic point of view, we think that city activities should not be separated from broader conflict prevention efforts, but also at the architectural level, we are of the opinion that any technical assistance on the field in city matters should be coordinated closely on the ground uh, in, under the umbrella, for example, of the UN resident coordinators and country teams. This thematic link should then be reflected in the way the UN is organized on the ground. Working in silo would not help to mitigate the impact of uh, city activities um, would not have to, would actually reduce in a way the impact of city activities on the field. That's why we would like to underline the importance of coordination of the one of the UN approach and the rule of society, society approach. And actually this is in the spirit that we are now engaging uh, in the GCTRS, GCTRS negotiation. So thank you again very much Ilko and the GCSS for, for this very good initiative. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Natalie, and thank you to you and the many other member state colleagues that are present today, knowing that you are uh, in the middle of these uh, these negotiations. Uh, we're very grateful for you for you joining and, and hope that today's event uh, has provided some some helpful, uh, helpful insights. Uh, we're going to move next uh, to uh, Dr. Khalid Kosar, Executive Director of the Global Community Engagement and Resilience Fund, or GSERF. Uh, Khalid, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ilko. I hope you can hear me uh, OK. Can you? Yes? We can, yeah. Great, thanks very much, you have to check. Look, let me start by thanking the organizers for allowing me to make this short intervention. And could I also congratulate the panelists on their excellent remarks. Could I also, as I think is appropriate, wish all of you and your families good health and positive futures during and after this pandemic. My name, as you've heard, is Khalid Kosser. I'm the Executive Director of the Global Community Engagement and Resilience Fund, GSERF. We're a multi-stakeholder global fund making grants to support local initiatives to build community resilience against violent extremism. Let me straight away acknowledge Ilko, who is on our governing board, and Kanesh, one of the panelists who chairs our expert independent review panel. Let me simply make three brief points, if I may. Firstly, I'm very struck and also very heartened that the global approach to CT and PVE is increasingly aligned with trends in the development and humanitarian sectors. I'm a counselor on the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council on the future of the humanitarian system. Our focus this year is on fast tracking localization, digitalization, and new partnerships. 
these themes clearly resonate with the approach being advocated by the panelists today. Secondly, equally, I think we need to be aware that achieving these goals is by no means straightforward. We need to genuinely put nationals in the lead as internationals step back. We need to promote South to South collaboration. We need to build community trust and we need dedicated locally relevant funding. Finally, this is exactly the approach to PVE that GSURF has pioneered over the last five years. We've invested $100 million in local partners, co-creating projects to respond to their realities, promoting transnational collaboration between them, supporting them through the COVID pandemic to earn their trust and funding them sustainably. Next Tuesday, GSURF will be launching its replenishment campaign, and I invite all of you to visit our website then to see us make our case for investment. Among many other things, it demonstrates why the most effective way to provide grants to support community resilience is by continuing to invest in a tried and tested global fund with gold standard processes and proven results, and certainly not by establishing a new one. Many thanks, and I look forward to your support. Thanks so much, uh, Khaled, for, for those remarks. And I think uh, in part answering some of the questions that participants raised uh, through the Q&A function around how to, to fund these quick response uh, uh, local uh, programs, um, either through or with the UN um, or, or, or outside of that, that structure to ensure that we're able uh, to, to respond to these, these needs as they, as they arise and prevent those um, from materializing uh, further in, in, in the future. Um, so international funds like GSERV and other um, uh, um, uh, mechanisms that allow for the quick, the quick release of those, those funds are, are really, really essential um, uh, to, uh, uh, to solving this, uh, this problem. So thank you for, for, for joining, joining us and for those remarks. Uh, next, we're going to turn uh, to Oliver Wilcox, the Acting Director CVE uh, uh, of the Bureau of Counterterrorism at the U.S. Department of State. Uh, Oliver, uh, the floor is yours. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much, Ilko, and to the Global Center for uh, inviting me to offer some uh, responses uh, to the panelists. First, I would just like to note that uh, the field and operational focus of uh, our panelists' comments uh, are very appreciated. I think we're all familiar with the problems and the principles, as I like to call them, of violent extremism and preventing or countering violent extremism. But uh, we spend uh, collectively probably less time uh, focused on the sort of operational uh, level solutions uh, to uh, those problems and to actually implementing uh, the principles that we often talk about at a general level. So I think that's the added value uh, of this uh, particular panel. I'd like to just flag four challenges and mention two priorities. Uh, the challenges that I'll outline very briefly uh, certainly build off uh, what the panelists have said, but uh, hopefully uh, provide some additional uh, points uh, for consideration and discussion. Uh, the first is that as um, the UN in particular and UNDP and other organizations have spearheaded the implementation of uh, a number of PVE plans of action uh, across uh, countries that uh, you face basically a strategic choice in an era of limited resources, uh, financial resources that is. Uh, the first is the development of those plans. Uh, the second is what kind of implementation uh, does one uh, support? Uh, is it uh, basically uh, getting uh, multiple ministries and agencies to work together? Uh, or are we uh, looking to really showcase and pilot results within one particular ministry or uh, agency of government? And uh, so it's a question of... Uh, breadth across multiple actors uh, to show that uh, the PBE POA is uh, working or is being implemented, or do you really go deep uh, into one ministry? And we've seen this in a number of countries. Uh, I'm thinking of a number of uh, the countries in the Western Balkans that have seen very good implementation of the PBE plan of actions within their ministries of education, for example. 
So uh, that's one of the sort of strategic choices uh, that I'm sure UN missions uh, have been grappling with on the ground. Uh, the second is making sure that uh, the implementation of these plans of action is not just at a central and national level and at a community level. As we know, uh, various countries have different forms of deconcentration or decentralization of government authorities, roles, resources, and responsibilities. And we need to make sure that we are operating not just with the uh, central authorities, uh, but that we are working with uh, and empowering as necessary and appropriate the governorate, provincial, district, and municipal uh, levels uh, of the Ministry of Youth and Sports, the Ministry of Social Development, uh, and so on. So those subnational uh, actors uh, are, are important uh, in uh, doing this particular work. The third thing is how do we make sure um, that youth activism is institutionalized and sustained on the ground? We're very good, I think, at uh, incorporating it uh, in the programming and in the projects, but how do we move from a sort of project by project feature uh, to a uh, more sustained uh, type of support for uh, youth leaders? Uh, and also, how do we, if uh, youth is one of our key constituencies, how do we identify local uh, adult leaders that we actually think have influence among youth. And that's a uh, hard uh, issue sometimes to get to the bottom of. I think we still sometimes assume or hope that a particular type of leader, and we've seen this often with religious leaders, um, that you know they, because of their moral authority or their uh, religious or cultural position, have some influence among youth. And unfortunately, I think the evidence is that uh, in a number of countries, traditional authorities uh, have lost uh, influence among younger generations. Uh, that, of course, varies from context to context, but we have to make sure that uh, we're really uh, engaging credible, quote unquote, leaders. We talk about and use that term, but we need to make sure that it's grounded in some sort of analysis at the local level. The fourth thing uh, I would say is that we need to make sure that the results and the metrics uh, that we achieve, and our panelists have talked about this, uh, are part of our host country engagement. I think uh, we continue to struggle at a programmatic and a project level with, and, and again, the panelists have mentioned this, measuring results, particularly in the prevention space. But when we do have good results and we do have good stories to tell, and we can really talk about the efficacy of these programs, is that being done is that being integrated into the more diplomatic engagements with the host country authorities? Because otherwise these metrics or these results will remain relegated to sort of program documents and internal technical conversations. They need to be integrated into the more political or diplomatic conversations that are being uh, had on the ground. Why? Because Many of the national authorities, uh, security oriented ones, as well as more human development oriented ones, need sometimes to be convinced that PVE interventions actually bear fruit. And in order to do that, uh, one has to be able to talk uh, cogently about the results and the uh, uh, stories, uh, and a lot of this is about storytelling, uh, not just quantitative metrics, uh, that these programs are actually um, achieving something. Uh, the two sort of priorities I'll mention uh, in closing uh, for the United States, uh, among others uh, these days uh, on PVE, the first is what we call uh, racially or ethnically motivated violent extremism. And uh, unfortunately, this has always existed, but uh, we're seeing it uh, in uh, more in a more pronounced fashion, uh, particularly its transnational elements. Uh, so that is something that um, we uh, know that the UN uh, is concerned about. I think about the Secretary General's uh, tweet about this a couple of months ago, uh, and 
uh, it's an issue that um, we all need to be uh, focused on. The second, of course, uh, is the rehabilitation and reintegration of uh, former terrorists, um, FTFs, and particularly their family members. Um, that's a thorny issue, but um, we certainly applaud and uh, encourage um, the UN agencies in the handful of countries where this work is going on uh, to continue those efforts, and we're happy to support them uh, in certain cases. So thank you again for the opportunity, Ilko, and uh, I turn the floor back over to you. Thanks so much, Oliver, for, for highlighting uh, both some of those challenges on operationalizing these, these kinds of PVE efforts, uh, as well as some of the priorities uh, from the US side, which uh, I, I recognize are, are shared by many others uh, on, this, uh, on this call. Um, I recognize many more participants have asked the floor, but I'm also very mindful uh, of, of time. So I'm going to take two more uh, uh, interventions and we'll ask uh, those um, providing those interventions to keep them as brief as possible. And I will then turn back to uh, the panelists for very short one or two minute reflections, either on some of the, the questions and answers that were raised uh, in the Q&A, uh, some of the uh, points raised by fellow panelists or those raised by, by those providing interventions. And hopefully we'll uh, land uh, the plane uh, not too far away uh, from our, our original original closing time. Uh, so the two people that I have remaining um, um, uh, for interventions on my list um, are uh, uh, John Charbonneau, uh, United Nations Director for Human Rights Watch, Watch and Haruna uh, Abdullaye, uh, Director of the Center for Community uh, Network and Trust uh, from, from Niger. So we're going to turn to John first and then Haruna second. Uh, John, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks. And I'm actually uh, Louis or Lou Charbonneau, um, but uh, uh, last name is, is totally right. Thanks for giving me the floor and thanks to the organizers and panelists um, for their insights at this very interesting event. Um, too often counterterrorism and countering violent extremism are used uh, as excuses to crack down on dissent and to trample on human rights. We've seen abuse of counterterrorism in Egypt and China's Xinjiang region and Sri Lanka, which was uh, discussed today, just to name a few recent examples. Um, Sri Lanka has repeatedly, in their case, uh, pledged to repeal the Prevention of Terrorism Act, the PTA, which has facilitated arbitrary arrests, denial of due process, torture, targeting, of Tamil and Muslim minorities, um, but the PTA remains in place. And replacement legislation that we saw as a possible improvement was withdrawn the same month um, a UN ODC project started, um, leaving it in place. And in January of this year, High Commissioner Bachelet found that security forces were using supposed anti-terror laws to suppress civil society. Um, as Ms. Singer said, today, and we fully agree with her, the PTA offers opportunity for abuse. Prevention means not just preventing terrorism, but preventing human rights abuses. And we're glad that she and others at the UN are pushing for an overhaul of the PTA. Um, the UNODC is running um, a counterterrorism project with the Sri Lankan government and law enforcement. Um, the singer said that UN engagement with the government offers opportunities to improve things. Um, and made clear that the UN doesn't support or endorse the PTA. But recent changes to the PTA have made it more, not less abusive. Um, the situation's getting worse. Uh, all actions of the government indicate that it is not committed to the goals espoused by the UN. Um, the Sri Lankan government in February published a list prescribing, prescribing as terrorist organizations, number of nonviolent eth ethnic Tamil diaspora groups, um, listing several hundred individuals as alleged terrorists, including many who are rights activists. These are people who've raised concerns about uh, Sri Lanka's abuse at the UN. Um, uh, the High Commissioner warned in her January report that independent review of the UN's actions in 2009 in Sri Lanka concluded there had been a systemic failure of the prevention agenda as the, the conflict concluded. The international community must not repeat those mistakes. Um, despite the pledges of never again, we worry that the UN could be at risk of repeating past mistakes. So the question is, when will the UN decide 
that it's not getting the results it wants, but could be de facto legitimizing or at least appearing to endorse a government responsible for increasing abuses, even if that's not the UN's intention. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lou, and apologies there for um, uh, misnaming you, but hopefully I had the pronunciation of your surname a, a little closer to, to home. Uh, thanks for those, those particular remarks on, on uh, prevention in, in Sri Lanka, and hopefully we'll have a chance uh, to hear some, some reflections there. Again, uh, noting that balance between um, uh, working with uh, and trying to change uh, some of the both legal as well as operational aspects of uh, uh, counterterrorism and PVE work, uh, whilst not wanting to uh, endorse or be seen endorsing uh, certain, uh, certain responses. Um, last but not least, uh, we're going to turn to Haruna uh, Abdullaye, um, from uh, joining us from, from Niger. Again, I'm recognizing that there are many other folks. I think we have another 10 or 15 requests for the floor, uh, but we do want to be mindful uh, of, of everyone's time and it's uh, this, uh, this busy time of, time of the year. Um, so I'm going to turn uh, to Haruna next. Uh, thank you, Elko. Uh, thank you for uh, all the participants for giving me the opportunity to participate in this uh, important meeting. So uh, in Niger, we we are in the Sahel and uh, we have a lot of problem of terrorist attack and uh, Boko Haram attack and even uh, extremist group in the Sahel in the Liptapo area. So we are uh, facing a new kind of terrorism, which is uh, like domestic terrorism, and uh, is coupled with uh, killing of innocent people. Like recently, they killed more than uh, 100 people. There's problem between uh, Fulani and uh, Kanuri and uh, Tuareg, which is uh, two community people that are sharing the, 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 the space. So my concern is like how the UN could uh, make easy some kind of uh, flexibility on the field to allow their uh, field office to be directly uh, engaging with CSOs and to execute uh, rapid uh, uh, like uh, punctual problems that uh, we are facing on the ground because CSO here we are uh, directly uh, in contact with the communities and then uh, there is like a, a development program that uh, we are seeing and uh, i wonder how the un can support in addressing this development program because all the peoples that are likely vulnerable to violence extremism are losing their livelihood uh, uh, terrorism are seizing their animals, uh, imposing them to pay taxes. And then if they lose all these things, then they will become more vulnerable and uh, very easy to, um, to follow the extremist group. So how the UN can develop this kind of very close uh, programming or very close grant that uh, uh, simple CSOs can uh, uh, execute in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, on the field directly because the process of the UN is very long and then if it's possible to see how to cut it. I will not be very long and uh, thank you very much. I will maybe have an opportunity to share more information about what is going there. Thank you very much for giving me this Thank you so much, uh, Haruna, and, and, and an excellent question there, and hopefully uh, one or, or some of the panelists can turn to that. How, how can we make cooperation easier, uh, particularly recognizing that a lot of the organizations um, at the local level are, are smaller groups or, or sometimes individuals uh, doing fantastically important work in this space, um, but, but are faced with, with um, uh, questions around funding, questions around security, questions around access to certain networks, certain knowledge, uh, certain engagements, um, and indeed, in many cases, very elaborate uh, protocols uh, for, for funding mechanisms, for applications to, to certain things uh, that, that um, might make it very difficult to actually engage on, on these issues. So how can we, how can we make the bars as low as possible there whilst guaranteeing uh, the highest quality of, of work and, and impact? Um, I'm going to turn now back to uh, our panelists and ask them to uh, take one or two minutes to respond to uh, a question. Uh, so for some final reflections, 
uh, or some additions uh, to, to previous statements. And I'll go to uh, Fadi first. Uh, Fadi, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Elko, for that. In very brief, let's say, I think here investing in civil society is the most important issue to be adopted by the UN whenever, whenever talking about any structural reform. It should go in a way or, or another uh, from whenever looking for the UN, looking for Security Council, Security Council resolutions and General Assembly and in a way or another looking for their existence in every country. But here, dealing with civil society, it is the key determining, it is the key, the F, key determining factor for the whole conflict dynamic systemic loop to be taken into consideration. I think the whole theory of change, it should start from there. Whenever talking about violent extremism, it is coming from the people and the people, the, the, the positive side of, of the people, it is the civil society where we should invest. And thank you so much. Thank you so much, Fadi. Um, turning, turning next uh, to um, uh, Nika uh, from UNDP. Nika, the floor is yours. Sorry, um, sorry, Yelko. Uh, what was the questions? So there's a number of questions that were raised in the Q and A, uh, including around uh, coordination, around funding mechanisms, around ensuring that uh, UN staff have uh, the right expertise and, and knowledge. Um, on uh, on issues of, of PVE, uh, as well as any other final reflections that you might have. Okay, final reflection. So I, I think um, uh, Fadi and other civil society uh, partners, they mentioned the importance of inclusivity and bringing that, but also I wanted to um, allude to the importance of participatory monitoring and evaluation. So, for example, if we are engaging civil society in our conversation, and I know, Fadi, in Lebanon, you're working very closely with UNDP, um, and that, thank you so much. But what does that mean that also you and the member state be a partner in monitoring what is happening? How are also we are including member of the community to be part of that committee that monitors activities? What does that mean to have the national action plan in a way that is being monitored. I know Kurtmola in Kyrgyzstan, we do have a monitoring platform to monitor the national action plan. Is it taking place? Is civil society also helping? No, those are the challenge. So we developed the national action plan, but and we even envision a monitoring system in place by civil society and member of community, but it's not happening. And that's where the line is still, we have a gap between the security and the prevention agenda. And, um, and as long as we are not able to strengthen that, we are still continue to have two pillars separately. And that the two pillar of the security and development be separated will have a reflection of how UNDP is also, uh, how UN is also reforming. So yes, we will continue to work together and advocate for stronger connection by increasing. And I know sometimes it comes very strongly to the security sector that we need to have bring the civilians to also monitor the work you do. But this is a work in progress. And um, as uh, our colleagues from UNODC, Masoud mentioned, we cannot afford not doing that. This is our duty. Human rights, it's the foundation of why we are existent. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nika. Uh, turning next to uh, Kurt Mola. Thank you very much, colleagues. Very thoughtful uh, panel and discussion. A lot to think about, I would say about two things. First of all, I think we always need to consider the result orientation kind of, and we need to think about how our prevention activities actually bring results and how we measure them. And I echo here Nika on this uh, on this matter, including participatory, participatory uh, uh, many. And the second is kind of last comment is about the importance of the innovation. Again, because this is so complex, we need to innovate all the times and think about new methods. Again, Nika here is the great example uh, spearheading the behavioral insights methodology, which is already working and being piloted in several countries. Uh, but also we live in a COVID times when the role of digital, digital uh, you know, tools and digital communication is increasing. Um, and also youth is increasingly mobile and digital. So we need also to think about this more also regional approaches maybe, or sub-regional approaches, or engaging a civil society in a new manner. So I think that these all innovations, both programmatic, operational, 
resource mobilization innovations, also engaging, I don't know, new donors and new, new partners. I think these are, these are areas we need to also look into. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kodmala. Um, turning to Hannah next. Thank you. Um, uh, <laughs> okay. I mean, uh, sometimes um, I, I, I wish if there was an easy way or an easy task to, uh, uh, to balance the challenge between engaging in certain areas where government policies or practice do not fully align with international norms and standards. I really wish. But, but um, I don't, uh, while I don't think it's appropriate to get into project specificities in this uh, form, but let me, uh, 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 as I said in my intervention, I, I, uh, we, um, I have recognized the, the many challenges of working with security services with a negative human rights record uh, or uh, to work within a problematic legal framework. Uh, and while acknowledging that this is a big concern, we need to, we, I believe, uh, and I think uh, the UN until now, we work with, um, we need to adapt and engage to change approach influencing government counterparts to better value and uphold the rule of law and human rights through uh, our interventions, rather than withdrawing uh, uh, from the discussions. I think as Masoud rightly uh, pointed out in his intervention, the UN cannot simply walk away from problematic situation. We can try to adjust, we should continue to adjust our engagement so that it takes into account the risks and mitigation but we, I believe that engagement still is uh, the most appropriate way to try to change uh, um, some of these behaviors. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. And then uh, last but certainly not least, uh, Valerie, uh, the final word is yours. Thank you very much. And first of all, I want to say that it was a very interesting discussion and all the interventions were actually very much complementing each other. So I really enjoy participating in this uh, discussion. Um, a lot of demands are put on the UN, I would say rightly so, but the UN cannot fulfill all of, all of them. And because a lot of what has been mentioned, we can never do it alone. You know, development, we are just a small player in development. The government is in the driving seat. Uh, when it comes to many other interventions, CSOs are essential. But I would say if I was to highlight one, um, I would say essential and unique role for the UN is really in what it relates to the normative agenda. And all of us, we have mentioned the issue of human rights. And I think it's really, if the UN was to do only one thing, I would say it's this one. First of all, because it's our mandate. We are really, it's the mandate of our organization to, uh, to define this normative agenda, to elaborate these conventions and so on and so forth. But also because I think that we have all discussed about this issue of human rights and this issue of protection. Of course, we need to protect people. That is essential. And here I'm talking about the protection of human rights defenders, of people who are working in this field of PVE and who are at risk, the protection of uh, the victims, the protection of the terrorists themselves, so that there is a due process because we can't tackle issues of, uh, I would say, violent extremism without taking, uh, having the human rights as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a compass. Protection of the children, I think Oliver mentioned that, the fact that there are so many children who are stranded in camps in Syria or else, and governments don't want to take them back. And this is a serious violation of human rights. But here, when I, when I say that we UN, we have this unique, unique mandate, it's because the voice of the UN matters, but more than that, when the UN speak, we don't do it with the same level of risk as other actors. Contrary to, I would say, CSOs or other partners, if I speak, if other UN colleagues speak, we don't risk our life. We are protected. We are protected by our immunities and privileges. Whereas people in civil society run their, the risk of their own life sometimes when they advocate. And I think that in that sense, I say out of the very demand, the multiple demands that are put on the UN, and as I say, that we cannot fulfill them all and certainly not alone, this one definitely we have to be held accountable for that. I think our voice matter, we have to use it and we are protected to use it because other people are not. So that's really uh, an important point that I want to raise. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Valerie, for uh, those, those final uh, thoughts. And thank you to everybody uh, for joining us today. I appreciate 
um, uh, the very helpful insights uh, of the many panelists and discussants uh, that made today's discussion such a rich and uh, rich one on this very complex um, issue. I uh, thank you to the Global Center team uh, for organizing the event and bringing us all together today. And as we look ahead to a very busy remainder of the year, uh, including, of course, the Global Counterterrorism Strategy Review in June, a very busy uh, General Assembly with a number of commemorations uh, and various mandate renewals towards the end of the year, uh, the Global Center looks forward to continuing to engage with all of you and providing uh, a place, be it online, be it in hybrid form, uh, for a constructive discussion to advance inclusive human rights-based approaches uh, to the root causes of violent extremism. Thank you again, everyone, for joining today uh, and wish you all a very good afternoon and a good evening. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye.